Good morning. This is Carol Reiser. I will be providing the lecture on uh, Module 17, the breasts and axilla. The breast examination is typically performed when a patient presents with a specific breast complaint or as part of an overall annual well-person physical exam. Examination, examination of the breast includes the examination of the axilla and the relevant lymph nodes in the chain. A major focus of the exam in adults is identification of breast masses, uh, skin or vascular changes that could indicate malignancy, the breast examination in children is important for tanner staging and as part of uh, an evaluation with hormonal concerns. Be sure to utilize the video clips, the checklist, exam summaries, and all the resources on the Evolve website. Uh, there are also PDA, downloadable, printable, uh, and audio step-by-step -step exam summaries. As a preview <coughs> of the complete exam, the next few slides include the main points, patient positioning, and uh, some of the examination highlights. As we know, the breasts are paired mammary glands located on the anterior chest wall, superficial to the pectoralis major and serratus anterior muscles. Look at figure 16-1 in your book, your Seidel text. In women, the breast extends from the second or third rib all the way to the sixth or seventh rib and from the sternal margin to the mid-axillary line. The nipple is located centrally and surrounded by the areola. We should be inspecting both areola and nipples, comparing for shape, symmetry, color, smoothness, size, nipple inversion, eversion, or retraction. We should re-inspect the breast with the patient in various positions. We'll talk about these positions later and what exactly how you uh, maneuver them and what you look for. But the, some of the main ones are positioning the patient with the arms extended over the head, or flexed behind the neck, the hands pressed on the hips with shoulders rolled forward, seated and leaning over, as well as in the recumbent position. We should uh, perform a chest wall sweep, as well as a bimanual digital palpation. We should also palpate for lymph nodes in the axilla, down the arm to the elbow, and in the super and infraclavicular areas. We should palpate breast tissue with the patient supine using light, medium, and deep pressures. Depressing the nipple into the well behind the areola is uh, also important. In males, we also inspect the breast for symmetry, enlargement, and surface characteristics and changes in those characteristics. Inspecting both areola and nipples, comparing for shape, symmetry, color, smoothness, size, and nipple inversion, eversion, or retraction. We should palpate the breasts and over the areola for lumps or nodules. We should palpate for lymph nodes in the axilla, down the arm to the elbow, as well as the supra and infraclavicular areas as we did in the female. <clears throat> we'll review some of the uh, anatomy and physiology that will help us um, talk about the complete physical exam of the breast. As we said before, there are paired mammary glands located on the anterior chest wall, superficial to the pectoralis major and serratus anterior muscles. Looking at figure 16-1 in your book, which you hopefully have already done, it will help you um, start with you're getting a good grip on visualizing the exam. 
In women, the breast extends from the second or third rib to the sixth or seventh rib and from the sternal margin to the mid-axillary line. This is important information to, for you to know and remember if you don't examine all the breast tissue, um, it could you know, tragically leave something undiscovered. The nipple is located centrally, surrounded by the areola, and the male breast consists of a small nipple and areola overlying a thin layer of breast tissue. The female breast is composed of glandular and fibrous tissue and subcutaneous and retromammary fat. The glandular tissue is arranged into 15 to 20 lobes per breast that radiate about the nipple. Each lobe is compo composed of 20 to 40, each lobule consisting of milk producing acini cells that empty into lactiferous ducts. The layer of sub-Q fibrous tissue provides support for the breast. Suspensory ligaments, known as Cooper ligaments, extend from the connective tissue layer through the breast and attach to the underlying fascia, providing further support. The muscles forming the floor of the breast are the pectoralis major, pectoralis minor, serratus anterior, latissimus dorsi, subscapularis, external oblique, and rectus abdominis. The proportions of each of the tissue components varies with age, nutritional status, pregnancy, lactation, and genetic predisposition. The vascular supply to the breast is primarily through branches of the internal mammary artery and the lateral thoracic artery. This network provides most of the blood supply to the deeper tissues of the breast and to the nipple. For the purposes of examination, the breast is divided into five segments, four quadrants and a tail. See page 457, uh, figure 16.2 will point that out to you. <clears throat> the greatest amount of glandular tissue lies in the upper outer quadrant. The breast tissue extends from this quadrant into the axilla, forming the tail of stents. In the axilla, the mammary tissue is in direct contact with the axillary lymph nodes. The nipple is located centrally on the breast and it's surrounded by the pigmented areola. The nipple is composed of epithelium that is infiltrated with circular and longitudinal smooth muscle fibers. Contraction of the smooth muscle induced by tactile, sensory, or autonomic stimuli produces erection of the nipple and causes the lactiferous ducts to empty. That's why if you've ever been a breastfeeding mother, you know that just looking at your baby and receiving that sensory uh, stimulation uh, will produce a milk letdown. Tiny sebaceous glands may be apparent on the areola surface called Montgomery tubercles or follicles. Hair follicles may be found about the circumference of the areola. Supernumerary nipples or breast tissue is sometimes present along the mammary ridge that extends from the axilla to the groin. Each breast contains a lymphatic network that drains the breast radially and deeply to underlying lymphatics. Superficial lymphatics drain the skin and deep lymphatics drain the mammary lobules. The complex of lymph nodes, their locations and direction of drainage, uh, the, uh, the uh, axillary nodes being more superficial and accessible to palpation when enlarged. The anterior, axillary or pectoral nodes are located along the lower border of the pectoralis major inside the lateral axillary fold. The mid-axillary or central nodes are high in the axilla close to the ribs. The posterior axillary or subscapular nodes lie along the lateral border of the scapula and deep in the posterior axillary fold where the lateral axillary or, bronchial nodes, or brachial nodes 
can be felt along the upper humerus. The breast evolves in structure and function throughout life. Childhood and adolescence represent a latent phase of breast development. The lark or breast development represents an early sign of puberty in adolescent girls. The developmental process can be classified using Tanner's five stage stages of developing sexual maturity. <clears throat> In using the Tanner charts to stage breast development, it is important to note temporal relationships, such as is it, it is unusual for the onset of menses to occur before stage three and about 25% of females begin menstruating at stage three. Approximately 75% are menstruating at stage four and are beginning a regular menstrual cycle. Some 10% of young women do not begin to menstruate until stage five. The average interval from the appearance of the breast bud, which is stage two, to menarche is two years. Breasts develop at different rates in each individual, and that can result in asymmetry. Tanner stage one is pre-adolescent. Only the nipple is raised above the level of the breast, as in a child. Tanner two is the budding stage, bud-shaped elevation of the areola, <coughs> where the areola is increased in diameter and the surrounding area is slightly elevated. In Tanner stage three, the breast and areola are enlarged and there is no contour separation. <clears throat> Refer to page 108 in your book. Uh, this is chapter five in the Seidel text, figure 510 will guide you here. Tanner stage four is evidenced by increasing fat deposits. The areola forms a secondary elevation above that of the breast. This secondary mound occurs in approximately half of all girls and in some cases persists in adulthood. Tanner stage five is the adult stage. The areola is usually part of the general breast contour and is strongly pigmented. The nipple projects. Striking changes occur in the breast during pregnancy. In response to luteal and placental hormones, the lactiferous ducts proliferate and the alveoli increase extensively in size and number, which may cause the breast to enlarge two or three times their pre-pregnancy size. The increase in glandular tissue displaces the connective tissue and the breast becomes softer and looser. Toward the end of pregnancy, as epithelial secretory activity increases, colostrum is produced and accumulates in the SNS cells. The areola become more deeply pigmented and the diameter increases. The nipples become more prominent, darker, and more erectile. Montgomery tuber tubercles often develop as sebaceous glands hypertrophy. Mammary vascularization increases, causing veins to engorge and become visible as a blue network beneath the surface of the skin. In the first few days after delivery, small amounts of colostrum are secreted from the breast. Colostrum contains more protein and minerals than does mature milk. Colostrum also contains antibodies and other host resistant factors. Milk production to replace colostrum begins two to four days after delivery in response to surging prolactin levels, declining estrogen levels, and the stimulation of the sucking neonate. As the alveoli and lactiferous ducts fill, the breast may become full and tense. This, combined with tissue edema and a delay in effective ejection reflexes, produces breast engorgement. At the termination of lactation, involution occurs over a period of about three months. The breast size decreases, but without loss of lobular and alveolar components, the breasts rarely return to their pre-lactation size. After menopause, glandular tissues atrophy gradually and are replaced by fat. The inframammary ridge 
at the lower edge of the breast thickens. The breasts tend to hang more loosely from the chest as a result of the tissue changes and the relaxation of the suspensory ligaments. The nipples become smaller and flatter and may lose some erectile ability. The skin may take on a relatively dry, thin texture and loss of axillary hair may also occur. For each of the uh, symptoms or conditions uh, discussed in the review of related history, uh, targeted topics to include in the history of the present illness will be listed. And as you read through your Cytel text, look for questions about these topics that can help you to uh, fully assess the patient's condition and provide clues for focusing your physical exam and to develop a, an appropriate diagnosis. If the presenting chief complaint is breast discomfort, think about the temporal sequence. Was the onset gradual or sudden? The length of time the symptoms have been present. Does, do the symptoms come and go, or is it always present? Is the discomfort related to menses? What is its timing and severity? Utilize your old CARTS acronym to help evaluate this, and as a review, Old CART stands for onset, location, duration, character, aggravating, alleviating, or associated factors, radiating pattern, timing, and severity. Also ask what kind of medications the patient is taking. Uh, be sure to include questions about hormones, bioidentical hormones, and of course, as always, prescription and non-prescription medications. If the chief complaint is a breast mass or lump, questions should include the temporal sequence again. And using the old Carts acronym can be helpful. The length of time since the lump was first noticed. Does the lump come and go, or is it always present? What is its relationship to menses? Is there a tenderness? Is there tenderness or pain? Is there dimpling or changes in contour? Has there been any change in lump size, character, or its relation to menses. Any associated symptoms such as nipple discharge or retraction. Again, let the old CARTS acronym guide your questions. When did it start? Does it occur in one or both nipples? Is the discharge spontaneous or provoked? Is the onset gradual or sudden? What is the duration, color, consistency, odor, and amount of the discharge? Is the discharge related to menses or any other activity? Was there a recent injury to the breast? Are there any tender lymph nodes? What medications is the patient on? With breast enlargement in men, is there a history of hyperthyroidism, testicular tumor, or Klinefelter syndrome? Klinefelter syndrome being the presence of an extra X chromosome in a male. And as we know, most people have 46 chromosomes, two sex pr chromosomes determining uh, if you become a boy or a girl. The girls having XX and the boys having XY. When an extra X occurs, it would be written as XXY. This occurs in about one out of 500 to 1,000 baby boys. Symptomatology includes an abnormal, abnormal body proportions as well as gynecomastia. Some medications that could contribute to gynecomastia include cimetidine, omeprazole, spironolactone, finasteride, and some antihypertensives and some antipsychotics. Also treatment for prostate cancer can include androgens or gonadotropin releasing hormone analogs. Illicit or, or recreational drugs such as anabolic steroids and marijuana can also have an effect. The past medical history should be explored and include whether or not there has been any previous breast disease, such as cancer, fibroadenomas, or fibrocystic changes. Is there a history of known BRCA1, BRCA2, or other genetic mutation? Any known hereditary syndrome, such as hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer? Lee-Fraumeyne syndrome, 
or Cowden syndrome? Are there any previous related cancers such as ovarian, colorectal, or endometrial? What kind of surgeries has the patient had? Ask about breast biopsies, aspirations, breast implants, breast reductions, or other plastic surgery. Also about oophorectomies. Have they had their ovaries removed? This could uh, produce hormonal changes. Have there been any changes in the usual state of the breast? Any pain, tenderness, lumps, discharge, skin changes, size or shape changes? Have there been changes in the breast associated with the menstrual cycle, such as tenderness, swelling, pain, or enlarged lymph nodes? Determine the patient's risk for breast cancer. Look at the table on page 461 of your Cytel text. These include modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. As a quick review, if you don't have your text in front of you, breast cancer risk increases with age, female gender, white race, inherited BRCA2 gene mutation, a personal history of breast cancer, have you had it before, a first degree relative with breast cancer, a previous atypical hyperplasia or lobular cancer in situ, now, note that fibrocystic changes don't really count here. They're generally benign. Also, a history of radiation therapy to the chest for any kind of cancer greatly increases your risk for breast cancer. Uh, having menarche before age 12 or menopause after age 55, having cancer of breast tissue, previous DES therapy, diethylstilbestrol therapy back in the 70s and 80s, uh, no parity, not ever having had a child, or late age at birth of first child. And sadly, we were reporting that after age 30, you're considered late age for birth of your child. Uh, combined estrogen progesterone hormone replacement use uh, after menopause. If you're on, and that's uh, the, the very common in, uh, use of um, bioidenticals. If you have been, if your patient's been on that for more than four years after menopause, that also increases the risk of breast cancer. Alcohol uh, overuse or abuse increases risk. Obesity increases risk and sedentary lifestyle all increase risk for developing breast cancer. And as addition to, in addition to assessing breast cancer risk, ask the patient how often she has had mammograms or other breast imaging and what the results were. What is the menstrual history like? What was the first day of the last menstrual period? What was the age at menarche? What was the age at menopause? What was the length, duration, and amount of flow and regularity of the menstrual cycle? What associated breast symptomatology is present with any? What was the age of the patient with each pregnancy? What was the length of each pregnancy, the date of delivery or termination? What number of children were breastfed and for what duration of time? When was breastfeeding last terminated? Now, if you ask your patient when uh, their last child was born, she may say four years ago. If you don't ask when, when breastfeeding was terminated, she may still be breastfeeding that four-year-old child. Stranger things have happened, you will see. Were any medications used to suppress lactation? It should be included in this uh, past medical history interview. Also ask about menopause. When was the onset? What was the course like? Were there any associated or residual problems? What medications have the patient been on? Be sure to include both prescription and non-prescription medications. Particularly ask about hormones such as estrogen and progesterone as well as the Selective Estrogen Receptor Modulators, or SERMs, such as tamoxifen, raloxifene, also the aromatase inhibitors, aromatase inhibitors, such as anastrozone, letrozole, and eczemestane. Excuse me. What is the family history of breast cancer? Were there any primary or secondary relatives that had it? What type of cancer was it? 
was their, what were their ages when the cancer was diagnosed, what kind of treatments were given, and what were the treatment results. Are there any relatives with known BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations? What other can cancer history or other history of breast disease have the family members had? As for the personal and social history, what is the age of the patient? Is appropriate breast support utilized with strenuous exercise or sports activities? How much caffeine does the patient consume? Has it had any impact on the breast tissue? Does the patient conduct breast self-examinations? At what time in the menstrual cycle are they conducted? Is alcohol used? How much? What about anabolic steroids or marijuana? Uh, review the information in your book on breast self-examination and breast self-awareness on page 463. That box 16-2 gives you a comprehensive review of this information. Pregnant women may experience sensations of breast fullness, tingling, or tenderness. Determine the knowledge level of the patient regarding colostrum, breast and nipple care during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Does she plan to breastfeed? Does she have experience with it? What are her expectations of breastfeeding? Does she have a support bra to wear throughout breast pregnancy and breastfeeding? What breast care products are currently being used? Is the patient using a nursing bra? Are there any symptoms of nipple tenderness, pain, or other problems such as cracking, bleeding, nipple retraction? What is the breastfeeding routine? Is she alternating breasts? What is the duration and frequency of feeding? What breastfeeding positions are used? Is a breast pump used? If so, how often? Explore the cultural beliefs about breastfeeding. Discuss some food and environmental agents that affect breast milk, such as chocolate or chemicals like those used in photography. Also discuss medications that may cross from the mother's bloodstream to the breast milk, such as cimetidine, clomestine, and thiouracil. What medications are being taken? Be sure again to ask about prescription and non-prescription, including herbals, which some patients don't even think of as a medicine. All medications should be evaluated for potential side effects in the newborn. In the older adult, skin irritation is a common problem that occurs under pendulous breasts, resulting from tissue-to-tissue -tissue contact or from rubbing of undergarments. Suggest some treatments for this. Is there any hormone therapy ongoing during or since menopause? If so, what is the name, dosage, and duration of these drugs? Next, we'll uh, go over examination and findings. And some of the equipment that might be needed during the examination portion of, the, of this lecture include a small pillow or folded towel, a ruler, a flashlight with transilluminator, and possibly a glass slide with cytologic fixative if nipple discharge is present. <clears throat> breast self-examination remains an important tool in the detection of breast cancer. Women should be educated on the benefits and limitations of breast self-examination. Women can notice changes by being aware of how their breasts normally feel and feeling their breasts for changes or by choosing to use a step-by-step -step approach and using a specific schedule to examine their breasts. In interestingly enough, teaching breast self-examination does not tend to improve its effectiveness. This was discovered in a randomized control trial uh, carried on in Shanghai in 2002 but published in the Journal of, National, of the National Cancer Institute. Every woman should be familiar with her own breasts and report any changes to her health care provider. Sorry about that phone ringing. Uh, we were saying um, 
Every woman should be familiar with her own breasts and report any changes to her health care provider. Um, review that box on page 463 of your site L text. It will give you um, a good overview. The American Cancer Society recommends breast self-examination as an option for women beginning in their 20s. As you discuss breast self-examination with the client, review the recommendations for early breast cancer detection, as well as discussing the issues related to breast cancer screening. Also, uh, review the evidence-based practice in physical exam box on page 466 of your Fidel text. And this uh, website at the bottom of this slide is at, from the Coleman site. Really lots of good information there. The more you read, the more you know about breast screening and you'll be able to educate your patients better. As the patient sits with arms hanging loosely at the sides, we first begin with inspection. Inspect each breast and compare it to the other for size, symmetry, contour, skin color, texture, venous patterns, lesions, and the possible presence of supernumerary nipples. Lift the breast with your fingertips, inspecting the lower and lateral aspects to determine changes in the color or texture of the skin. The skin texture should appear smooth and the contour should be uninterrupted. Alterations in contour are best seen on bilateral comparison of one breast with the other. Inspect both areola and nipples. The areola should be round or oval and bilaterally symmetrical or nearly so. The color ranges from pink to black. In light-skinned women, the areola usually turns brown with the first pregnancy and remains darker. In darker-skinned women, the areola is brown before pregnancy. A peppering of non-tender, non-separative Montgomery tubercles is a common expected finding. The surface should be otherwise smooth. The Pio de Ronge skin associated with carcinoma is often seen first in the areola. And that word is spelled P-E-A-U D apostrophe O-R-A-N-G-E. And it has to do with the, the way the skin looks over a carcinoma. Most nipples are everted, but one or both nipples may be inverted with the nipple tucked inward. In these instances, ask whether there is a lifetime history of inversion. Recent unilateral inversion of a previously everted nipple suggests malignancy. So be sure you go over the figures on page 465 of your text and get a good idea of what you're seeing if you see this in clinical practice. The five Ds related to nipples, uh, a good mnemonic is discharge, depression, discoloration, dermatologic changes, and deviation. Reinspect each breast with the patient in varied positions, including arms extended overhead or flexed behind the neck, hands pressed on hips with shoulders rolled forward, and seated, leaning forward from the waist. For all patient positions, the breast should appear bilaterally symmetric with an even contour and absence of dimpling or retraction. You'll be surprised to notice when you try all these positions for a patient with a mass or a lump, how strikingly obvious it will be in one position and not at all visible in another. So be sure you, uh, you try this. With the patient in the seated position, Perform a chest wall sweep by placing the palm of your right hand at the patient's right clavicle at the sternum. Sweep downward from the clavicle to the nipple, feeling for superficial lumps. Repeat the sweep until you have covered the entire right chest wall. Repeat the procedure using your left hand for the left chest wall. The bimanual digital palpation technique involves placing one hand, palmar surface facing up, under the patient's right breast. Position your hand so it acts as a flat surface against which to compress the breast tissue. With the fingers of the other hand, walk across the breast tissue, feeling for lumps as you compress the tissue between your fingers and your flat hand. 
repeat with the other breast. The lymph node palpation is used to palpate for lymph nodes in both male and female patients. To palpate the axilla, have the patient seated with arms flexed at the elbow. Support the patient's left lower arm with your left hand while examining the left axilla with your right hand. With the palmar surface of your fingers, reach deeply into the axillary hollow, pushing firmly so that you gently roll the soft tissue against the chest wall and muscles of the axilla. From the apex, palpate downward to the bra line and along the inner aspect of the upper arm down to the elbow. Reposition your fingers to palpate the medial aspect along the rib cage and into the anterior wall along the pectoral muscles. Reposition again to palpate the posterior wall along the border of the scapula. Repeat the mirror image of this maneuver for the right axilla. Then palpate the supra and infra infraclavicular areas for the presence of enlarged nodes. Hook your fingers over the clavicle and rotate them over the entire supraclavicular fossa. Have the patient turn his or her head toward the side being palpated and raise the same shoulder, allowing your fingers to reach more deeply into the fossa. Have the patient bend the head forward to relax the sternocleidomastoid muscle. These nodes are considered to be sentinel nodes, virtile nodes, so any enlargement is highly significant. Be sure you review, review, review virtual nodes. Move your fingers to the infraclavicular area and palpate along the clavicle using a rotary motion with your fingers. Lymph nodes are not usually palpable in a healthy adult. So if you find one, that is of significant uh, note. In the picture on this slide, uh, the A, B, C, D, E, F, the A is indicating the pectoralis major muscle, the B, the axillary lymph nodes level one, the C, axillary lymph nodes level two, D is uh, axillary node level three, E is supraclavicular lymph nodes, and F are the internal mammary lymph nodes. Uh, palpating in the supine position. Have the patient raise one arm behind her head, and then place a small pillow or folded towel under that shoulder to spread the breast tissue more evenly over the chest wall. The ideal position for examination is to have the nipple pointing toward the ceiling. Women with large breasts may need to roll slightly to achieve this position. Palpate each breast separately. Palpate all areas of breast tissue, feeling for lumps or nodules. Remember that when the breast tissue extends, remember that the breast, breast tissue does extend from the second or third rib to the sixth or seventh rib and from the sternal margin to the mid-axillary line. It is essential to include the tail of stents in palpation. Recall that the greatest amount of glandular tissue lies in the upper outer quadrant of the breast with tissue extending from this quadrant into the axilla to form the tail of spence. Palpate using your finger pads because they are more sensitive than your fingertips. Palpate systematically, pushing gently but firmly toward the chest wall as you rotate your fingers in a clockwise or counterclockwise pattern. At each point as you rotate your fingers, press inward using three depths of palpation, light, then medium, and finally deep. The exact sequence you select for palpation is not critical, but a systematic approach will help ensure that all portions of the breast are examined. If a breast mass is felt, characterize it by its location, size, shape, consistency, tenderness, mobility, Delineation of borders and retraction. Transillumination can be used to confirm the presence of fluid in certain masses. These characteristics are not diagnostic by themselves, but in conjunction with a thorough history, they can provide a good deal of clinical information that can be correlated with findings from diagnostic tests. 
Describe any breast mass or lump that you encounter using the following characteristics. The location, use clock positions and the distance from the nipple. The size, enter it in centimeters, include length, width, and thickness. The shape, whether it's round, discoid, lobular, stellate, regular, or irregular. Its consistency, firm, soft, or hard. Is there tenderness? Mobility, is it movable in what directions? Or is it fixed to overlying skin or subadjacent fascia? The borders, are they discreet or are they poorly defined? Is there retraction, the presence or absence of dimpling and altered contour? All new solitary or dominant masses must be investigated for further diagnostic testing. Remember to palpate the tail of spence, both axilla, and to document masses. Palpate the depression behind the areola. Note any discharge from the nipples, whether or not it is spontaneous, unilateral, and from a single duct. In men, expect to, find, expect to feel a thin layer of fatty tissue overlying muscle. Obese men may have a somewhat thicker fatty layer, giving the appearance of breast enlargement. A firm disc of glandular tissue can be felt in some men. The breasts of many healthy newborns, both male and female, are enlarged for a brief period of time. The enlargement may be noted at birth and is the result of passively transferred maternal estrogen. If you squeeze the breast bud gently, a small amount of clear or milky white fluid, commonly called a witch's milk, is sometimes expressed. The enlargement is rarely more than one or one and a half centimeters in diameter and can be easily palpated behind the nipple. It usually disappears within two weeks and rarely lasts beyond three months. <clears throat> the right and left breasts of the adolescent female may not develop at the same rate. Reassure the girl that this asymmetry is common and that her breasts are developing appropriately. Breast tissue of the adolescent female feels homogeneous, dense, firm, and elastic. Although malignancy in this age group is rare, routine examination provides a great opportunity for reassurance of her development and to educate her on breast self-examination. By establishing this habit, she can develop something very healthy through a, a very healthy habit for life. Many males at puberty have transient unilateral or bilateral subareolar masses. These are firm, sometimes tender, and are often a source of great concern to the patient and his parents. Reassure them that these breast buds will most likely disappear, usually within a year. They seldom enlarge to a point of cosmetic difficulty. However, pubescent males experience gynecomastia, an unusual myth and unexpected enlargement that is readily noticeable. Fortunately, it is usually temporary and benign and resolves spontaneously. If the enlargement is extreme, it can be corrected surgically for psychologic or cosmetic reasons. In rare instances, biopsy is, is required to rule out the presence of cancer, but gynecomastia can be associated with the use of either illicit or prescription drugs symptoms resolve after the drugs are discontinued. This is important to know because <clears throat> uh, once we had a uh, young man come to the plastic surgeon um, in the outpatient day surgery area for reduction of gynecomastia, basically male breast reduction, and once he was had his blood drawn and the top screen drawn, he was um, engaging in marijuana use which was not, uh, he did not tell anyone, of course. So we canceled the case, and as we know, gynecomastia can resolve after uh, marijuana use is discontinued. So in this case, it saved the young man surgery, but uh, can point out the, um, you know, just the importance of our interview with clients. In the pregnant female, the nipples enlarge and are more erectile. As the pregnancy progresses, the nipples sometimes become flattened or inverted. A crust caused by dried colostrum can be evident on the nipple. Inspect the breasts and expect to see a real other broader and darker. Montgomery tubercles are common. Palpation reveals 
a generalized coarse nodularity, and the breast feel lobular because of hypertrophy of the mammary alveoli. Dilated subcutaneous veins may create a network of blue tracing across the breast. During lactation, it is important to assess whether the breasts are adequately supported with a properly fitting bra. Palpate the breast to determine the degree of softness. Full breasts, which are firm, dense, and slightly enlarged, may be engorged. Engorged breasts feel hard and warm and are enlarged, shiny, and painful. Engorgement is not an unusual condition for the first 24 to 48 hours after the breast filled with milk. However, its later development may signal the onset of mastitis. Clogged milk ducts are a relatively common occurrence in lactating women. A clogged duct may result from either inadequate emptying of the breast or a bra that's too tight. The clogged duct will create a tender spot on the breast and may feel lumpy and hot. Frequent nursing or expression of milk, along with the local application of heat, will help open the duct. A clogged duct left unattended may result in mastitis. Examine the nipples for signs of irritation. Redness, tenderness, and even blisters or petechiae, which are precursors of overt cracking. Cracked nipples may be sore and may be bleeding. Lighter colored nipples are no more prone to damage from breastfeeding than are darker nipples. Nipple damage from breastfeeding is associated with placement of the nipple in the infant's mouth. After pregnancy and lactation, there is regression of most of these changes. The areola and nipples tend to retain their dark color and the breasts become less firm than in their pre-pregnant state. The breasts in postmenopausal women may appear flattened, elongated, and suspended more loosely from the chest wall as the result of glandular tissue atrophy and the relaxation of suspensory ligaments. A finer granular feel on palpation replaces the lobular feel of glandular tissue. The inframammary ridge thickens and can be felt more easily. The nipples become flatter and smaller. Hormone replacement therapy can result in fluid-filled breast cysts, and these can also be painful. Please review the differential diagnosis table for details on the differences between fibrocystic changes, fibroadenomas, and breast cancer. Page 477 of Seidel. This will be important information for you to know. Galacteria is lactation not associated with childbearing. Elevated levels of prolactin resulting in milk production occur as a result of disruption of the communication between the pituitary and hypothalamus glands. Common causes include pituitary secreting tumors, hypothalamic pituitary disorders, systemic diseases, numerous medications and herbs, as well as physiologic conditions and local causes. The subjective data associated with galacteria includes spontaneous nipple discharge, usually bilateral, Possible related medical histories such as amenorrhea, pregnancy, post-abortion, hypothyroidism, Cushing syndrome, or acute renal failure. Paget disease is the surface manifestation of underlying ductal carcinoma. A crustiness of the nipple, areola, and surrounding skin occurs with red, scaling, crusty patches that may be unilateral or bilateral. Mastitis, as we've already talked about, is an inflammation and infection of the breast tissue. Most of these infections are staph. Mastitis is common in lactating women after the milk is established, usually the second to third week after delivery, but can occur at any time. Abscess formation may result. <coughs> Gynecomastia in breast is breast enlargement in men, as we've said, and the pathophysiology may involve increased body fat, hormone imbalances, anywhere from puberty to aging, uh, associated testicular, pituitary, or hormone secreting tumors, liver failure, or various medications or steroids. When testosterone levels are low relative to estrogen, the breasts would grow larger and more noticeable. When body fat increases, more estrogen is produced, and this also causes breast enlargement. Fibrocystic changes are caused by benign fluid filled cyst formation caused by ductal enlargement. Fibrocystic changes are usually bilateral and multiple, occurring in women age 30 to 55, most often associated with a long follicular or luteal phase of the menstrual cycle. T 
tender and painful breasts, four palpable lumps that may fluctuate to menses are common. Fibroadenoma or benign tumors composed of stromal and epithelial elements that represent a hyperplastic or proliferative process in a single terminal ductal unit. Fibroadenoma may occur in girls and women of any age during their reproductive years and may be asymptomatic until discovery in clinical breast exam. And then after menopause, these usually painless tumors will often regress. Malignant breast tumors include ductal carcinoma arising from the epithelial lining of ducts. Lobular carcinoma originates in the glandular tissue of the lobules. The pathophysiology of malignant breast tumors includes mutations of normal cells resulting in uncontrolled cell division and tumor formation, which, which also results in invasion of surrounding tissue and metastasis through the lymph and vascular systems. The peak incidence is between ages 40 to 75. It, the symptomatology includes a painless lump, changes in size, shape, or contour of the breast. Tender axilla express nodes or, or lymph nodes are involved. This may be the first sign that the client notices is the tender, tender uh, lymph node. Breasts may have dimpling, retraction, or prominent vasculature. The skin may have that peau de range or thickened appearance, and the nipple may be inverted or deviated in position. Introductal papillomas and papillomatosis are benign tumors of the subareolar ducts that produce nipple discharge. Epithelial hyperplasia produces a wart-like tumor in a lactiferous duct, which may occur singly or in multiples. There may be spontaneous nipple discharge. Duct ectasia is a, defined, is a benign condition of the subareolar ducts that produces nipple discharge. Subareolar ducts become dilated and blocked with desquamating secretory epithelium, necrotic debris, and chronic inflammatory cells. This occurs most commonly in menopausal women. Spontaneous unilateral or bilateral nipple discharge, often green or brown in color, may be produced. Breast enlargement in girls before the onset of puberty is called premature galar. The cause is unknown. The breasts continue to enlarge slowly throughout childhood until full development is reached during adolescence. The degree of involvement or enlargement varies from very slight to fully developed breasts, usually occurring bilaterally, while other signs of sexual maturation may be absent. This concludes Module 17, Breasts and Axilla. Thank you for your attention.